Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Mike Stevenson. Mike is the founder and managing director of Thinktastic, Scotland's motivational communications agency that helps move organisations from we can't do it to we can do anything. You're a multi-award winning entrepreneur and one of the UK's most sought after inspirational speakers and creative thinkers with an exceptional record of transforming organisational fortunes. With more than 30 years top level experience working with clients such as the NHS, Sky, Standard Life, University of Leeds and the Scottish Government, your aim is to set the world alight with new ideas and fresh approaches that will lift people and make home work and community life more fun, more inventive and more productive. Homeless to fearless, this man changes lives. Mike, it's an honour and a privilege to have you here. Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm delighted to be here and what an introduction. <laughs> that sounds really good, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds yeah. fantastic. It makes me sound really old as well, which... Uh, <laughs> But that's, a, that's an aside. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's an aside. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, if we can begin at, yeah. uh, I suppose, the very start, you know, who is Mike Stevenson? What was your early life like? And yeah, how's that kind of shaped you as a, as a person? Mike Stevenson is a child inside a man's body. <laughs> uh, but, but what I mean by that is I have never grown up uh, in the kind of conventional way. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I still see the world as utterly uh, compelling and I see lots of spaces and I see things that we can change where others have sort of stood still and said, hmm, that's an impasse. Hmm. So I'm, I'm, I suppose my life has been about reinvention and, you know, never saying die. I'm a survivor hmm. above everything else. Um, where, where it started... Um, my, my mother was Lebanese, um, brought up in Egypt, yeah. um, who met my father during, just after the war. Uh, and uh, she came over to live here. My father was Scottish-Irish, uh, and they, um, well, they had me. They had my, my sister first, and then they had me, and then two brothers that followed. Mm. And when I was about three, my father got a job in Pakistan. So uh, we were shipped out there and I was there for three years. So uh, this extraordinary memory of being, you know, transported to an another culture, I mean, entirely different culture. And I remember the smells, the, 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 the sounds, the, the busyness, the, the entrepreneurship that was everywhere, because mm -hmm. to survive, you had to do something, you had to, you, you had to sell something, you had to grow something. Uh, so really vivid memories of Pakistan. And then, uh, when we came back, we came back through Egypt. So I remember being on the, the banks of the Suez Canal. This is very shortly before the Suez Crisis, when mm -hmm. the Suez Canal was, was closed for, for a number of years. Uh, and then into Rome and Naples and, you know. So that was an extraordinary awakening for a child. But the, the, the downside of that was that uh, I went to kindergarten in, in Pakistan. I went to primary school in Edinburgh two different primary schools and then we moved to Kirkcaldy. Um, so from Lahore to Kirkcaldy uh, is quite a switch. <laughs> uh, the first thing I remember is being incredibly cold when I came back here. Mm -hmm. Incredibly cold. I couldn't understand how all these boys who looked like me, sounded like me, uh, were superheroes who could run around in a playground when the temperature seemed to be minus 33. It was probably about four or five degrees. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never settled in education. I hated school. Um, and when I went to secondary school, um, I never settled. I, I couldn't understand why uh, I found sitting in a classroom, you know, for uh, an hour at a time, now I do understand that really no one should sit in a classroom for an hour at a time mm. listening to a teacher. <laughs> that's, my, that's my conclusion. But I, I was thrown out at the age of 15. And at that time, my parents were splitting up and the, 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 the family was dissembling. I mean, I won't mm. go into more details, but uh, I went down to London to uh, seek fame and fortune. I got a job. I was doing all right. I was working in a shop, selling furniture. 
And then I got the sack because apparently none of the customers could understand a word I was saying with my Fife accent. <laughs> so uh, to cut a long story short, uh, things began to fall apart a bit and ended up, um, you know, no job, uh, no home, no home, no job. So I ended up uh, sleeping out, uh, or started out sleeping out. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that was an uncomfortable, um, exciting, exhilarating, uh, you know, challenging, uh, threatening experience. Mm. And that was for about a year. And, you know, I suppose I learnt that, you know, I could survive. That was the first thing. I also, in a strange kind of way, that was me learning who I was as an individual. And, I, and it's quite a really? distinctive individual. And before I, you know, I got out of it um, because I met a couple of Irishmen and they said, you know, you play the guitar. And I said, yeah. They got me a guitar. We went to Dublin and I started busking there. Hmm. So that was my, you know, journey from, from birth to finding myself as a performer on the streets of Dublin. In yeah. fact, I was the first guitarist to perform in the streets of Dublin. And I had, um, you know, people who would come and see me perform that included uh, Thin Lizzy's, uh, Brian Downey and um, the most famous of all, Thin Lizzy, yeah. Phil Lynott. <laughs> uh, so that was an extraordinary awakening for me. I was a performer. Unbelievable. Mm. It's, what I think is so admirable is that you look upon, you know, that your period being a sleeping rough, if you like, um, as a kind of almost positive thing that shaped you in a positive way. Because I wasn't sure as to whether that, mm. you know, you kind of, I don't know, potentially carry emotional scars or whatever, but you, you kind of look at it, or you, you maybe choose to see the positive element of it, I suppose. I, I think w what it is, um, we all have a choice. Mm -hmm. And I've had, you know, downs, I've had lots of dips, lots of downs in my life. Now, you can, I think there is an element of choosing to be scarred by it. Now, I don't want to diss anyone who's had a horrible early experience, mm -hmm. but th there is an element of choice. You know, um, I saw in a film the other day, uh, I think it was Shirley MacLaine said, you know, you don't make mistakes, mistakes make you. So, hmm. can you flip it round? Can you say, um, you know, this is horrible but I'm learning from this. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, I'm learning that I don't want to be here again. And to try and look at what is a horribly negative experience, and I've, I've had a few as well, I don't want to go into, mm -hmm. but they could have scarred me for life. But you, you have experiences that suddenly give you uh, an insight. One was when I was uh, sleeping out, uh, it was in Piccadilly Circus and it was really, really cold. It was a, a January um, night and this van drew up. This woman got out of the van. She said, we're from this charity and we'll, we're going to take you to a hostel, put you up for the night and in the morning we're going to help you find accommodation. And I thought, great. Um, and this is probably the start of me understanding what communication is about. Mm -hmm. So I was taken to this place called The Spike in Peckham. Big hostel. And I was shown into this green tiled room. That's how I remember it anyway. And the first thing that was said to me was, uh, take your clothes off, which I did. And the next thing I knew, there was a hose pointed at me and unleashed. And I was told afterwards that that was de-lousing uh, mm -hmm. spray. Mm -hmm. Now, I realised then that I wasn't looking for accommodation above everything else. What I was looking for was to feel valued, to feel significant, mm. to, to believe that I had, you know, um, a history and a future. And none of these were forthcoming. So uh, my dignity had been absolutely squashed. So I went back into the streets because back on the streets, I had a reputation, I had dignity, I had, you know, some degree of control over my life. So that taught me that, you know, primarily, you know, what we need to do for people is to make them feel that they have value. And you look at so many workplaces, so many situations where we don't do that. 
And children mm -hmm. in particular, we see lots of interactions where they're devalued mm -hmm. and humiliated, ritually humiliated. And the impact of that is quite profound. Yeah. So I learnt, you know, lots of little things that changed my view of, of, of the world. And I suppose that gave me an insight into what motivates people and what belittles them. Mm -hmm. A kind of early awakening of what I now do. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. I'd like to come to what you now do. Um, if you can kind of give, I suppose, a, a snapshot or overview as to the career path that you've had and how it kind of led you to where you are. Right. Well, the, the career, well, there was no career path. Yeah. That, that's the first thing. <laughs> um, nothing, it was random. I mean, I had, I went back to London. I had a succession of jobs. I, I corked wine. I worked on building sites. Um, I worked in a biscuit factory. I worked in the steelworks in Sheffield. I worked in a, what they called a terminal hospital. Can you believe? Um, and... Oh, I, I worked in Wimpy's as a dishwasher, lots and lots of jobs. Mm -hmm. And th the thing that really struck me during that period was, and this l really leads to what I'm doing just now, is you would arrive at a job and you'd be given tasks to perform. So there were two experiences that, that really sprang to mind. One was later on when I arrived in the steelworks in Sheffield and, and I... I was performing what was a heavy job. It was a, um, a maxi press operator, and we were producing this uh, object. Right? Mm -hmm. So I had to take this heavy bit of molten steel and put it into a into a die and clamp it down, <coughs> and then pass it on to the next person. And I said to the foreman, "What is it we're actually producing?" And he said, "You don't really need to know that." <laughs> And I said, but I really do want to know that. Mm -hmm. And he told me it was camshafts for Ford Motors. And I think, wow, you know, this was a typical task-driven job. And it's kind of indicative of a management rather than a leadership culture. Yeah. But there was, a, there was the opposite of that when I arrived in a building site in London in Earl's Court. And there was a big Welsh foreman who greased me and he had, you know, soft hat and a had a broken nose. He looked like he'd done, you know, five rounds with Floyd Patterson, uh, who was a boxer at the time. <laughs> uh, and he put his arm around me and he says, Michael, welcome. And I thought, I've been welcomed. This is extraordinary. And he said, before you start, I want to show you something. And he showed me into this hut and he showed me the plans, the elevation. And he says, this is the palace you're building. And I thought, I'm building, you know, I'm just a, a small bit part player. But from that day on, he made me feel that I was a vital part mm -hmm. of this, you know, enormous operation where we're building a palace. And that was a real awakening as well, because I realised then that his whole approach was one that motivated me and all the other members of the team. You, you would have thought there was a hierarchy you know, I was a labourer, but mm -hmm. he said, without you, nothing will happen. Mm. And every day he would, uh, you know, clap me on the back and say, well done. If he saw something I could do better, he didn't say, you know, stop doing it that way. He would say, I've got a trick. You can do this a wee bit better. Mm. So I realised at that point that motivation is something that should be in every workplace. Because why do you go to work in the morning if it's not with a sense of purpose and a sense of you know, high value mm -hmm. and an energy that comes with that? Mm -hmm. But then I, I saw in other workplaces that, that just did not exist. Mm -hmm. And it still doesn't exist in many workplaces. It's no one's fault. It's just that this vital component is missing. So you get this job description culture, which is essentially task driven. We're now moving on. You know, you are managing minds. You're managing intelligences. You're mm -hmm. not managing a task. Mm -hmm. So um, this is what I do in organisations. I try and, you know, unlock the, the, the creativity of people so that they feel that they are part of the end, that they are, they are, they are achieving something. Mm -hmm. 
and that you know, no matter what department they are in, they have an influence over the wider organisation. Um, so that, that's a, a really important learning part of yeah. my work experience. Then in my uh, 20s, I, I went to college outside Edinburgh, New Battle Abbey, which is for failed people, you know, people who failed the educational experience mm -hmm. first time round. And there I was, I was 22, and I was with people who were 70, 30, 40, 50, and that was a, a, a brilliant experience because they'd come from all kinds of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, I got a job, uh, you know, looking after children in a, a play scheme. So I think, wow, I've been given responsibility mm. for other people, for children. And I loved it. Then I went on to community work and uh, in the early 80s, 1984, um, I, was, I was one of the kind of founding members of the Wise Group, or mm -hmm. what became the Wise Group through Glasgow. So I became a manager there, a senior manager. We grew to 600 people in 10 years, wow. which is probably too fast if, if, if you were to ask me. But I had you know, a lot of people um, in my charge, many of whom uh, you know, had come, well, come from long-term unemployment because that was the whole purpose of the organisation and who you know, deserved to feel that they had not just a future, but they had you know, the capability of turning all the hardship of unemployment and you know, whatever they'd experienced turning that into an advantage because if you've been out of work and someone gives you the chance, you've got an energy and a, and a sense of purpose that you, know, you don't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I was able to tap into that. And mm -hmm. I made mistakes. I've made mistakes at every single point in my life, but mistakes are there to be learned from. Yeah. Um, and then, mm -hmm. you know, in early 90s, I set up with a, a partner, a design agency, uh, which for you know, 17 years I was riding high, we were doing really well. I took over um, in 2006, bought my partner out, and and then 2008 came along and it hit us really badly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. again, out of adversity, what would you do? Thinktastic was born. <laughs> what does Thinktastic mean? Uh, oh well, the, uh, people ask me that and I, I say, it's, in a way, it's to think in the manner that a child thinks. So, yet yeah, no matter what the situation, children will find a solution. They'll look at things laterally, they'll look at things yeah. creatively. If you put a barrier in front of them, they will find a way around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you get older, you know, some of that shuts down. Mm -hmm. And that's really the tragedy of our perception of young and old that we're meant to kind of close down, we're meant to, uh, you know, get into an established mode of thinking. And I challenge that, absolutely. So Thinktastic is saying, you know, whatever your mindset is, it can be shifted. And this mm. is not some sinister, um, you know, mind game. Yeah. This is saying, you know, you will meet challenges. Life is exciting. Um, life at work is exciting. Life outside work is exciting. You've got to find that excitement and you've got to find, you know, your capability, which is sometimes buried underneath all kinds of early experiences. You don't think, I can't. I, and, you know, you develop this uh, linguistic pattern at work. You know, people say, it's not my department. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll mm -hmm. email, email me that. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And whenever I go into organisations um, who I work with, under the Thinktastic banner, I will do this Room 101 exercise and say, you know, what are those words and phrases that sink your spirits? The same ones come up. Hmm. Same ones come up. Uh, it's not my problem, it's not my department, I can't do that, I'm too busy, uh, I'll look at that tomorrow. The same hmm. ones come up. So people are aware of the things that, you know, thwart them at work, but it's how do you change that, that culture? Yeah. So that's part of Thinktastic. It's, it's, you know, I call it a motivational communications agency because even the way you write can lift or sink spirits. Mm. Are we there to just inform people or are we there to inspire them? And I say, information without inspiration 
falls flat. So it's mm. every part of an organization's communication, every part of uh, a community's inspiration, uh, uh, communication has the capability of being changed. Mm-hmm. And, I'll, and I'll give you an example of the, the, the kind of thing. I was doing, for one local authority, I was doing a communication strategy for them. And, and I said I would like to go and speak to young people. And they said, young people, yeah, 18, you know, 19. I said, no, younger than that. I said, they don't vote yet. And I thought that was a fairly short-sighted view. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I persuaded them. And I was in this school in a second year class. And I, and I warmed them up a bit, you know, asked them a few questions. And I turned the, the council logo and I said, what does that say to you? And this wee boy said, no ball games, mister. Right, so there is an example of inadvertent thwarting mm-hmm. in our communication. So in other words, children think the council is there to stop them doing things because hmm. that's their first, that's their default position. Hmm. And when I fed that back to the council, they were absolutely staggered by it. That this was the first thought that came into a child's mind. Yeah. They're there to stop us playing football. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that kind of spread. And I, I was talking to a big... Um, audience in Edinburgh where there were councils present. And one of the councils says, we're going to stop doing that. This was in Edinburgh. Uh, so sometimes it's simple things. But you think of all the little things that are done on a daily basis that belittle people rather than lift their spirits. Yeah. And we do thousands of them. Our notices, our signposting, um, the kind of communications that come out inside an organisation, the emails we send, they're not there to, you know, purposely diminish people, mm-hmm. but they do it unintentionally. Mm-hmm. And this is the kind of communications that I want to teach Scotland or, you know, inspire Scotland to, to look at again and take up. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm just sort of thinking aloud, but we don't necessarily have a culture where people love going to work. People don't have that sort of enthusiasm that you're talking about. How can we potentially move, you know, what can we do to move to a place where people are keen to go to work and do their, their best every day? Well, the, it, it is the, the culture of the organisation. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, it's easy to say the culture, and it's easy to say we need to change culture. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. But, you know, someone coming from the outside like me can help to, to deliver that in a way that doesn't make the chief executives, the managers, feel threatened. Mm -hmm. Because it's important that they're part of the the change, that the whole thing is really uh, something that everyone can take ownership for. Now, there is not a leader or a CEO I know that doesn't want um, a member of their staff to come to them to say, I've got an idea that's going to help us to go forward. It's going to deliver faster, uh, cheaper. Um, make a bigger impact on our clients, get more clients, you'll get more customers. Um, no CEO uh, is going to refuse that. So the first thing is that people can get quite defensive as mm. managers because our default position is to complain about what not, what's not right. Am I right? <laughs> uh, so the first thing to do is to give a real sense of purpose. What are we all here for? And you hear organisations describing what they do in quite a technical way rather than kind of vision. Do you you know what I mean? So I I was talking to um, a group of housing associations in in Ayrshire recently and I simply asked the question, you know, are you a housing organisation or are you a people organisation? And when I started to unpick that, yes, we're a people organisation. The homes that we build, the homes that we provide, <clears throat> are a mechanism. They're not the end in itself. So sometimes by just shifting the vision, the whole focus of the organisation, you can unleash something in people mm-hmm. that is really much more spirited. And, and yes, it can be done. I've seen people move quite significantly just in half a day hmm. in terms of the perception of their value to this bigger picture. Bigger picture. So when we create organisations, uh, you know, if you look at some of the new companies that are setting up, they've got a totally different view. 
mm. you know, Google's vision um, to organise all the world's information and make it accessible to people. Yeah. How exciting must that have been when you joined Google, when this was just, you know, a fool's vision. Bill Gates, uh, when he sat at Microsoft, a PC in every home, in every office. How audacious were these vision statements? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what they did was to say to their people, you are delivering this. Your ideas are driving us forward. You know, no one, there's no hierarchy on ideas. Mm -hmm. And we want you to be part of creating this, you know, fantastic, um, you know, purposeful organization. Mm -hmm. And Google, I know there's questions about Google and there's questions about every company, mm -hmm. but what Google does, it, it empowers its staff to be the, the innovators. So the driverless yeah. car came from a member of staff and it's got nothing to do with Google's <laughs> uh, main purpose. Yeah. yeah. So that is what, you know, unleashing the, the, the creativity and the spirits and the energy and the enthusiasm of people mm -hmm. and they will come to work with a spring in their step. <laughs> I know it sounds like, uh, you know, a, a simple process. Actually, it is. You know, when you go to work, you go to work to do a job and someone else does another job and you look across the room and you think, hmm, if only, but you don't say that because it's not your department. And they mm. will say, it's not your role to tell me that I could do something a bit more, you know, um, imaginatively. So you take the creativity at the workplace and you take everything at the workplace, mm. you know, mm -hmm. because if you're just there to perform the task and to do the job that's embedded in a job description, mm -hmm. then what are you bringing to work? Mm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the job description becomes a reason for not imposing on someone else's you know, tightly defined role. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's also a reason for not doing something. Hmm. It's not my job description. Someone once said to me in an opening gambit at a workshop I was running for a large organization, I'm not paid to think. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about. That's tragic. Now, the leaders don't want that. Yeah. They're not saying you're not paid to think. Mm -hmm. Or if they are, they should probably reconsider yeah. their job. But this is what we have created. In mm -hmm. every organisation that is older than, you know, 40, 50 years. Because we've inherited this industrial model. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've schooled people in an industrial model. Does that make sense? You, yeah. you sit in rows in classrooms mm -hmm. and, you know, we're trying to change that in education but it's taking a long time and we do, do, do need to look at things really quite radically mm -hmm. um, because the, the whole production line mentality still exists in organisations where there's nothing that they're producing. It's a service industry. It's a, mm. They're producing ideas and, and possibilities and opportunities. They still operate in that model. Mm -hmm. hmm. I, I feel as though I have to ask, what's the vision for Thinktastic? Thinktastic's vision uh, is, you know, to reshape Scotland in a very positive way um, and to, to get the word Thinktastic included in the Chamber's 20th century <laughs> dictionary as, as, uh. as, a, as a statement of the modern age where we really do need to rethink things in a totally, you know, dynamic, um, imaginative way. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you advocate getting rid of job descriptions altogether? Um, in a way, yes. Yeah? In a way, yes. Because what I want to know when I start a job is, you know, uh, what do you want me to achieve? Yeah? And um, that's really it. What do you want me to achieve? You know, um, and what are my, you know, key responsibilities? What are my responsibilities that no one else has got? Because hmm. that's what and motivates people. Because mm -hmm. you say, you know, to people, I'm a. And I say to them, you don't be a, be the. So huh. when you get people saying, I'm only an administrator, uh, I say, you're the engine oil of the organisation. And they go, I've never thought like that before. <laughs> you know, so it is, it is not difficult to do. 
but it requires a whole culture, cultural shift. So Think Tastic is about making that mindset shift into the future. And, you know, Scotland being the, the epicentre of this mm -hmm. revolution, but spreading it around the world, which is what we've traditionally done best. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Do you, do you think we have made steps towards that? In some, well, yeah, I mean, in terms of social enterprises, for yeah. example, uh. Uh, in terms of taking an issue like homelessness mm -hmm. and saying, you know, we are going to end homelessness. Well, that's a great start, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and that homeless people are not problems, they're not liabilities, they're actually opportunities. Because, you know, if you want to get someone uh, to go into a classroom to speak to young people about the pitfalls and the dangers and the, the, the opportunities in life, get someone who's been homeless. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get a billionaire. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is... So, the, the, and children, young people respond, because I go to schools, I'm asked to speak in schools, and I get amazing feedback from schools. It's like, you know, I've had one, this man, you know, he's just changed my life. Wow. Wow. From a 15-year-old, right? That is extraordinary. Mm. So the, the opportunity um, at the moment is to... Is Scotland doing enough? No. Is any nation doing enough? No. Mm. Uh, there are nations that have got the ability to transform what they do when they find a better way of doing it. Finland has done that. You know? mm -hmm. Finland is a different kind of country from Scotland. Although, hmm, is it? So much of what we bring as models to Britain is based on the United States of America. And in terms of business, in terms of lots of things, brilliant. But there are limits to what we should be taking from America. And we should be looking to the Scandic models. And, you know, Finland turned its health around, turned its education around. Mm -hmm. And these are two um, fundamental parts of a thriving, healthy, flourishing society. Yeah. Let's not diss them. Mm -hmm. You know, these are huge. And they also, you know, looked at Nokia and said, Nokia, a very successful company, we want Nokia to be a kind of um, agricultural uh, starter for the, mm -hmm. the, the, the industry. So we've got a successful company. We want, you know, it to plant lots of seeds and, and, and to grow them. So Finland is a good model. There'll always mm -hmm. be someone that says, oh yeah, but Finland, they've got this and they've got that. And you think, that is what is wrong. Hmm. Yeah, you hmm. see, you don't have to become Finnish, uh, <laughs> but you take, you know, the essence of that model and you think, what can we do? But I want Scotland to be the country that's leading on ideas. So I think there are things we're doing exceptionally well. What, what we are doing at the moment is, is challenging, you know, the natural order. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're also possibly challenging um, politics as we know it, although we need to go a lot further than that. Mm -hmm. We need to, we can't afford to go into the sort of default, you know, uh, you know, crossfire across the benches. Uh, but I think the Scottish Parliament and the way that was set up um, is, is a great exemplar because it's not got the, the benches sitting opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, it's meant to be less ad adversarial. People yeah. have got less time to, they've got limits on how much time they can talk. And it's meant to be much more consensual. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think that, you know, Scotland can draw on its history um, to inspire, you know, its future. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a land of opportunity. That's not a political statement. Hmm. That's a statement of fact. I mean, we've got, you know, a third of the landmass of the UK, 61% of the coastline. And we're sitting saying, you know, we're too small. Or some people are saying we're too small or, you know, we... We're lucky to be in the World Cup finals at all, so we shouldn't expect to get there. You don't hear that in New Zealand. Hmm. You don't even hear it in Iceland now. Mm -hmm. So we've got to lift ourselves up and say to our young people, you know, you are important. You're, you've got a value. Mm. Um, don't just accept the world as it is. You know, challenge it, shape it. And you've got all this energy and all this creativity. You know, use that to shape your school, your neighbourhood, your city your country. Hmm. It's a really important message. Yeah, really is. Really is. Okay, I'm going to go mining for some tips here. Um, yeah. What makes a great speaker? Ah, <laughs> you see, I, I, 
Not everyone might agree with me on this, right? Okay. I think the, the first thing is uh, passion and enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. The second thing is authenticity. Mm-hmm. I don't talk about things I don't know about, mm. right? I talk from my own experience, and I might supplement that with things that I've seen and people I've met. Uh, and that authenticity is really important because I suppose I could take any subject and say, I'm going to speak on this tomorrow. But how much of me is in there? Not a lot. Hmm. Um, the next thing is, I think you need a sense of theatre. You need to surprise people. You need to, to you know, have unpredictability about it. And you need to tell stories. Mm-hmm. I mean, I equate you know, standing up and delivering a speech as the same as seeing a great film. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a story, uh, but it surprises you, it, it challenges you, it, it might frighten you. I don't go to frighten people, but you want it to inspire people. You want them to see the world in a different way. Mm-hmm. So th- all these things are important, but there's also, I don't use notes mm. at all mm-hmm. now, mm. right? If I'm teaching people, which I do, um, I really work with them as people. So some people start with a model. This is how you speak. And they are trying to fit into a model. But the important thing about the speaker is who they are. And then you develop the techniques. You know, you start with a bang. You know what I mean? Uh, The other thing is topicality. Because if you deliver uh, a speech and, you know, something has happened in the world... If you don't mention that, it looks as if you've been insulated from it. Mm-hmm. It looks as if your speeches could be two weeks old, could be a month old. That is really bad. So, and also knowing the audience. Mm-hmm. You know, who is the audience? Um, have I met people this morning in the audience I can bring up during my speech? Because that shows that you're connected. Um, and there's in- the ability to engage people. So in other words, you interact with the audience. Not necessarily, you know, by asking them questions you want answers to, but you want to see people nodding, you want to see people laughing, you want to see people open-mouthed, awestruck, Mm. you want to see people blown away by a story, and you want to see people who are going through that kind of, wow, you know, this is changing something. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's what I mean by engagement. Mm-hmm. So you, it's, it's, it's a film, it's a, it's a book, it's something that is different from the written word because you're bringing it to life. Yeah. And I learnt this, I think, when I went to Dublin because Dublin's got a great oral culture. And there was I, you know, I was 18, it was 1968. Ooh, dear, that, that places me, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I should be giving up now, I should be retiring. You know? Give the game away. Yeah, yeah. People say, why aren't you retired? I said, Jesus, do me a favour. But I found <clears throat> storytelling was a huge thing in Ireland. As it is, you know, in the Hebrides in Scotland, brilliant uh, storytellers. Hmm. And I learnt a lot from that. I also learnt, you know, to read uh, some of the great writers, writers like James Joyce and his stream of consciousness. You hmm. know, this, wow! It was just amazing. So I, and then of course I was performing, I was singing and playing the guitar. So the two kind of merged together. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I learned how to be a storyteller. And then, you know, when I became a community worker, uh, a few years after that, um, oh, actually, let's go further back to that. Because wherever I went, wherever I worked, all of a sudden, I was the union rep. I was always voted the union rep. Hmm. Even at college, I was voted the college rep. Wherever I went, people wanted me to represent them on the union. And I thought, why is this? And I think it's because um, I was quite a persuasive speaker. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to speak, why do you speak? Is it just to inform people? Well, that's pretty boring, isn't it? Uh, is it to inspire people? Well, that's purpose. Mm-hmm. So if I'm a teacher, I'm there to inspire, to catalyze, 
you know, to enthuse people, to give them the learning bug mm. so that they go off with their curiosity peaked and learn themselves. That's what I'm there to do. So as a speaker, I'm there to inspire mm. and to persuade. And that came, I think, from those uh, talks, those dis discussions, those conversations I, I had in Dublin pubs, <laughs> where it was really about arguing, but with a bit of persuasiveness. <laughs> not shouting people down, not ranting. It was yeah. conversational. And that gives you a real insight into what, you know, switches people's thinking or challenges the way they think in a kind of non, I'm putting you down, you're wrong. You know, no one is completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, no one is wrong. It's maybe where they come from or their particular frame of reference, you might introduce them to another frame of reference. So mm -hmm. you don't say you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Because what does that do? It shuts the door. Mm -hmm. Does absolutely that make sense? Does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some really good stuff in there. <laughs> really good. Yeah, I like the idea of uh, your talk being like a film. I've never really heard that comparison. Actually, it's well, a great way of looking at it. When I'm, uh, you know, do you remember World in Action? It was a really good uh, program in Scottish television on ITV. I think it was so. made in Manchester. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and World in Action took you know quite a big issue, a big issue, mm -hmm. and it kind of broke it down. So yeah. it would start off with someone speaking at the, the top of the show. You know. Uh, one of the recipients of, you know, what's happening, one of the people that's experienced it, one of the people that's leading it. So it kind of broke it down into a way that was really bite-sized, but impactful and not, and not shallow. So it was a mm. great example. And you still see documentaries that are like that. But in, in a sense, that's what a film does. Mm -hmm. it's, it grabs you from the first moment yeah. and leaves you wanting more or leaves you uh, wanting to do something or leaves you, you know, uh, inspired, awestruck. Um, your, your appetite for something has been not quenched, but, but you know, you, you want to thirst for something. You yeah, know what I mean? Tantalised. So, absolutely. Yeah. Remember children? Yeah. When you came out of a cowboy and Indian? Uh, well, that's what was available in my <laughs> young days. And you would run around and you would shelter in shop doorways and, you know. Yeah. So why aren't adults like that? I think adults are like that. It's just uh -huh. we've learned to control those emotions and we've shut ourselves off to that kind of childlike um, enthusiasm. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. And I want to reignite that childlike enthusiasm. I love that. And I do say to people, you know, um, this is what children like, but you do as well. And they go, yes. So, you, you know, we don't lose that. Mm -hmm. We want to rediscover that enthusiasm that yeah. children have. We want to, and I say, you know, a child learning to walk falls on average over 200 times. Mm. What do they do? They just get up. Mm -hmm. They just get up. Mm. How many times would we fall before we said, I'm not gonna be very good at this? You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the difference. So mm -hmm. never say die. And, you know, you, we need to reignite that in, in uh, people because this is what drives um, societies forward in a positive way. Definitely. You know, and it's not, oh, we've now got digital technology, we've got social media. Uh, that is an arrival of a new world. <laughs> it's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to go from social media, which has become quite vitriolic, Mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. some, for some people, yeah. and it's become quite threatening to other people. We need to move to live speaking, <laughs> you know, because that is, I think, there's going to be a, a, a reignition of live speaking. They say Gladstone spoke at Waverley Market, you know, back in the day, yeah. and he spoke for four and a half hours, and people stood and watched him and listened to him. <laughs> pre television, yeah, pre radio. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we need to go back to, um, you know, the whole culture of uh, people speaking yeah. and opening up these conversations. Right behind that. Love it. Good stuff. <laughs> Looking back on your life, mm. I mean, how do you think you have evolved as a, as a person? Well, my, my, my confidence has grown at every turn. Mm. 
and you realise that um, your confidence can be, you know, fairly limited. So I was confident enough to stand up and sing and play the guitar, <laughs> yeah. right? And I got a good audience, I got a brilliant response and people thought, you know, here's a, a star in the making. But I didn't promote myself, you know, I was just bad at that. So I had a confidence at doing it, but not confidence of putting myself out there, mm. you know, and saying, mm -hmm. I can sing and play the guitar. Uh, and I did, you know, I did, you know, I was the first act on at the Radio Clyde Festival in Glasgow in 77 or something like that. So I, and I've done some festivals, I've done, you know, quite a lot of nightclubs, uh, I've done some of the clubs in Dublin, but there was something saying, you're not worthy. So I had a confidence in doing that. Then I had a confidence in, you know, being able to do different jobs. So, you know, you start a job and you, you take you know, half an hour to do something and then, you know, within two weeks, you are doing it so fast, mm -hmm. you know, it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a different kind of confidence. But the kind of whole confidence that comes from inside, um, you know, people need to feel the, the confidence in all areas of life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I've put myself out there, I've challenged myself, and, but I've had no choice to do that. Mm -hmm. I've had no choice but to do that. So I think I've got a confidence that comes from, and it's not a loud confidence. It's, a, you know, I know who I am. And I'm learning, I keep learning. And I keep, you know, exploring new avenues. And I keep topping up my confidence. Mm. Because there are people who are very confident in one sphere mm -hmm. and then put them in another sphere and suddenly whew, yeah. they deflate. So I think I've got a, a, a developed confidence. It's quite, quite strong. It's quite well developed. It's like it's been blown up over mm -hmm. years and years and years. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is that I've been very good at using the things I've experienced um, as a kind of positive um, means to galvanise people, to make them think differently, to relate to them. Mm. Because there's no point in me saying to someone, you know, um, you know, your job, it could be done better. If I haven't had lots of jobs myself, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I've been at the very lowest rung. So I know what it's like to feel I'm not valued in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like uh, to be thrown a, a curved ball mm -hmm. when you least expect it. I know what it's like to be given a dressing down when you didn't need a dressing down. Hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think being able to empathise comes from all that experience. And if, if there's yeah. one thing I've learned above everything else, that's empathy. And we've got an empathy deficit hmm. in the world today. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Big time. Hmm. I'm going to ask you a few questions that kind of go a little bit deeper, maybe a yeah, bit yeah. more kind of philosophical. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first one of which is about purpose. Um, in terms of, you know, yourself, your, your kind of uh, journey, um, what do you feel has and, and sort of continues to be your purpose in life? Ah. I think, well, my purpose is, you know, to, I suppose my long-term purpose is to ensure that every child, um, regardless of who they're born to and where they come from, um, you know, is allowed and encouraged and inspired to flourish. Hmm. So we need to give them the tools. We need to give them the confidence. And we've got an absurd divide. I was in Easter House, South Easter House, a number of years ago, and it was a large room, and I said to uh, this room of, of people, you know, can someone sum up what life is like in Easter House, in South Easter House, it was a particular part of Easter House, and there was a kind of silence, you could have heard a pin drop, and this elderly statesman woman said, uh, well, son, see if you want a suntan, or a criminal lawyer, like a brilliant place to live. See if you want to buy a banana. You've got to get on a bus and go a mile down the road. So 
I'm rejoicing in that. Because actually, we were running a campaign in the area, and we used it to lose a banana, because mm. you have extraordinary uh, talents and ideas and, and, and personalities in every corner of Scotland, in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm talking Scotland just now. Mm -hmm. um, because if you were to say, you know, my purpose, it would start with Scotland to make sure that every child um, has the exposure to experiences, um, gets a chance to shine at, you know, what they're potentially good at, gets a chance to explore the wider city, mm. the wider country, mm -hmm. gets a chance to experience joy, gets a chance to experience, you know, sadness, but it's what you do with that sadness. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my purpose, to make sure that, it's easy to say, isn't it, that every mm. child flourishes. In America they say, no child left behind. Well, that's a double negative. And in <laughs> fact, lots of children have been left behind. And they say America doesn't understand irony. Um, mm. And we, we need to say, you know, every child um, is a gem. Mm. Every child is a gem. And if their parents have difficulties, and many do, let's not diss the parents. Mm. Let's help the child and help the parents. Mm -hmm. We, you know, every, for, in pure economic terms, we need our, you know, children from very early years through to leaving school, leaving university, leaving college. We need them to be, you know, really clear that they have a value, mm -hmm. they've got skills, they've got ideas, they've got the capacity to keep learning, mm -hmm. and they've got experiences which will, you know, have got enormous value and enormous currency in the world. So that would be my mission. <laughs> Amazing. I, my, I love your passion, it genuinely. It's, it's so infectious. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope I'm not infectious with my sore throat, you know, but... I would like, I would like, you know, to create um, a social virus, which is really, really a positive one. Oh, that's brilliant. What a great uh, metaphor. <laughs> what would you like your legacy to be? How would you like to be remembered? My legacy would be uh, that th there, there are little fires that have started that are, are still glowing mm -hmm. and maybe even have caught you know, light, um, you know, across uh, different sectors, different uh, organisations across Scotland. Um, so I'd like to be seen as a fire starter <laughs> um, who, who never allowed the, the water, you know, to quell the flames and never gave up. It's <laughs> a great answer. Great answer. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I think it came from the foreman on that building site, mm -hmm. actually, when he said, you know, you are building a palace. <laughs> and I said, but I'm just a Bricky's labourer. And he said, you are a Bricky's palace. We don't have any ownbies on this building site. And I suddenly felt this huge surge of energy and uh, enthusiasm and purpose. I was there first every day. Mm. And I was the last to leave. And he gave me the keys to the site to lock up when I'd been there for three weeks. So I think it was that feeling of being trusted. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't a piece of advice. It was, a, it, it was something that was spoken to me. Um, and it wasn't advice. It was um, a statement you know, aimed at me to make me feel that I was important. Mm -hmm. That we don't have hierarchies. Because every single person has got some, you know, vital part to play in building something uh, bigger. Mm -hmm. So the the, vi the advice was, you know, in in a sense, if, if I turn that round, that everyone has got value. Yeah. You know, everyone has got the ability, the the value, the 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 experience, the knowledge, you know, to contribute something to, you know, creating something fantastic. Hmm. <laughs> what are you most grateful for in life? Well, I'm grateful 
to my parents, although things went, you know, quite... I'm grateful to them because they gave me um, the experience of travel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that experience of travel was hugely influential on me. So th th that's, you know, in 1953... Uh, to be transported across to Pakistan and then to uh, see, you know, different cultures on the way back. Mm -hmm. That was hugely formative and people say, well, it was only three years of your life. Wow. Three years between mm -hmm. the ages of three and a half and six and a half. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So th that I'm grateful for that mm -hmm. because if I hadn't had that, I, I, I would have seen the world, I think, entirely differently yeah. um, and I might have been parochial in that kind of you know uh, as there were immigrants coming in to Britain I thought wow this is exciting when I saw um, the curry becoming the most popular dish I thought that was exciting you know so um, I, mm. I had my mind opened up to a world of colour and a world of possibility and a world of poverty and a world of you know all these things mm -hmm. at a very young age so that's what I'm most grateful for mm. That's great. It's funny because I read, um, it was an article, and it said that you refer to, when you moved away and came back, it was like going from Technicolor to monochrome. Mm. <laughs> what, was, what, was, what do you mean by that? Well, um, and, and, um, well this, is, this is really... Uh, in Pakistan, the, the, you know, the saris, the, it was awash with colour. Yeah. I mean... Um, in, in a lot of poverty cultures, colour is a huge part of... And then you look at spices. Mm -hmm. You've got a spice stall and it's got vermilion reds and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this enormous, you know, this turmeric, the, the, the yellow. Yeah. So I was exposed to colours uh, early on and colour is really important. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Scotland, and I don't have to tell you that we, ha we do celebrate grey and beige in Scotland. And I think you would never tamper with central Edinburgh because we've got the most, or Glasgow, we've got the most incredible architecture. But when it comes to, you know, uh, smaller towns, uh, villages, um, some of the peripheries of cities, mm -hmm. we should be introducing colour. You know, colour. And I say this mm. to people all over Scotland and I show them photographs of coloured environments from Nova Scotia. I show them Tirana where the, it was an artist ran for mayor in Tirana, the capital of Albania. And Tirana was post-Soviet battleship grey. And artists don't run for political office. Mm -hmm. But he got in and he, he'd gone round and he'd spoken to people and he says, what can I do that doesn't cost me a lot of money because I don't have a huge budget, um, you know, to make you feel better, your mm -hmm. life's better. Mm -hmm. And they said, we want more colour, we want more trees planted, and we want our civic spaces cleared up, right? So, Eddie Rama being the kind of determined, that was his name, Mayor Eddie Rama, being the kind of determined individual that he was, he was a very charismatic young guy, I think he was 37 when I heard him speak. And he developed a palette of colours, and they did, they painted Tirana. They cleared up the civic spaces, and they planted 15,000 trees. Now, one of the unintended consequences of that is that crime came down. Really? Yeah. So, you know, when you look at, you know, how can our imagination find purpose in, in Scotland just now? One is colour. You know, more um, Balamori, which is actually Tobramori. Mm -hmm. Why not? And mm. when I show photographs to people they say oh we'd love that so we need imagination we've got a big creative industry here mm -hmm. uh, we've got amazing art colleges mm -hmm. um, particularly in Glasgow and Dundee although Edinburgh you've got a very strong art. where is the benefit of that mm. um, where is mm. the benefit you know when we're looking at um, you know creating new environments and yes, uh, they'll say we've got limited budget, but you know there are outside the budget. We've got lots of things that can be done. Yeah, and you know signage. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but colour is really important. So I mm. think that I got this kind of need for colour mm -hmm. stimulus uh, early on mm -hmm. by being abroad. And that's what I mean about Technicolour to monochrome. Yeah. Because, you know, coming back to Scotland in winter, and, you know, you, you, my brother was up in Sky last week and they had photographs and it was beautiful. But it didn't have to be colour. It could have been a black and white. So mm. we need colour. Mm -hmm. Kids need colour around them. Uh, adults need colour around them. What do we do when we go shopping? You know, we don't just... I mean, I'm dressed in black. That's because I think the colour comes from within. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I really do think that colour is important. And I think that's where it came from. Yeah. I've never really um, thought about it, but I, mm. you know, I, I get excited by window displays. I get excited by uh, clothing. I get excited by paintings. I get excited by all sorts of things and plant life. You know, you go to the yeah. botanical gardens yeah. in Edinburgh or Glasgow and you see this amazing range of colours and you think, that's inspiring, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, it really is, yeah. Something that I have to say myself, thinking about it now, probably drastically overlooked. Well, we do, yeah. because yeah. we just accept yeah. the world as it is. And, uh -huh. and I don't accept the world as it is. <laughs> Never. Not ever. Yeah. It's there to be changed. And, and Scotland could become a great exemplar. When we're, you know, regeneration is something I feel very strongly about. Mm -hmm. Because lots of money's been spent on, on areas. Usually areas that are impoverished, so there's a lack of opportunity. And not a lot changes, if we're being completely honest. Mm -hmm. Because we don't do the right things. Regeneration starts with hearts and minds. Get people engaged. Get people's ideas there, however, you know, bizarre they might be. And bricks and mortar should follow the vision and the passion of, of you know, the people there. But you've got to make them believe that they have got, you know, every right, the same right as someone who's got, you know, a, um, a billion pounds in their bank account to have a life of opportunity, a life of colour, a life of, you know, uh, experience, mm -hmm. you know, and regeneration should not be just about bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. It should not just be about landscaping. Mm -hmm. It should be about something much more, uh, you know, exciting than that. Yeah. Something that really does. I, I, when I work with a, a local community, usually it's through an organisation, I will ask the audacious question. Um, how are we going to make this area a tourist attraction? <laughs> and they go, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but there's a legitimate question there. Yeah. You know, what can you do in this area? I show them a wall in Dresden in Germany, right? Mm -hmm. And this wall is lovely. It's turquoisey colours and, and it's a gable end. And it's got this kind of um, silver pipe work. It's like trumpets going up it. You know, it just, it looks amazing. Mm. And I say to them, what do you think of that? And they say, oh, that's brilliant. And I go to the next slide and I say, do you know, every time it rains, this wall plays music. So do people go from around the world to visit that? Yes, they do. <laughs> do people go to Tirana? Tirana was never a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, yes, they do. So that is the kind of imagination and you know, thinking beyond what we believe is possible, yeah. that we need to engage in, and you know, my my job is as a catalyst, mm -hmm. you know, as a facilitator, as as the as the kind of inspiration, and I will bring ideas from around the world. But ultimately, we have that capacity, yeah. and we don't use it. And children, hmm. phew, yeah, you know, <laughs> children have got ideas beyond their station. No, they don't. They have ideas that are visionary, yeah. and we don't listen to them today, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll rue not listening to them in 10 years' time. Yeah, it's true, unfortunately. I think we need more Mike Stevensons in the world. <laughs> I don't know if my girlfriend would agree. <laughs> but, you know, uh, well, we need, what we need uh, are more people who have got the 
the willingness to step outside, you know, what's expected of yes, them. Yes. And not to expect anything of themselves and to say, you know, nothing that is human is impossible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you had the opportunity to speak to your 20 year old self, what would you say? Um, okay, nurse yourself when you fall, <laughs> but see it as a learning opportunity, see it as an opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing because, you know, I've had broken relationships. I've gone into quite, you know, I plummeted into quite, you know, um, deep, dark places. Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, this is a bit like, you know, the best opportunity you ever get to um, turn this into an opportunity. You don't feel like that just now. No, no way. But keep that in your, in your head because, you know, whatever is happening, see this as something that's going to define you in a positive way, hmm. not a negative way. Yeah, yeah. And it seems as though that's very much something that you have done. Yeah. You have kind of practised. Yeah, well, I've, I've tried. And, you know, yeah. and look, I, I do the best I can. And the reason I'm doing what I do is because everything went wrong. I had no career path. <laughs> I had no qualifications. You know, nothing was there to say, give this man a job. So I'm probably unemployable. Now, I would say to people, why is he unemployable? That's absurd. All this experience, you know, hmm. all this sort of spread of, of knowledge, why is he unemployable? And I would say, I should be very employable. Employers should be clamouring <laughs> to get me on board. I don't understand that. Do, do you? Yeah, no, do you I don't. I mean? I, yeah, yeah. So um, the, 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 another shift is really towards um, valuing experience because experience yeah. is knowledge. And we're now, you know, moving. And I did facilitate something with NHS Lothian and a number of organisations recently. And it was about peer support. Mm -hmm. So we've got a mental health, you know, crisis. I, I use that word because, you know, from, from children through to um, people in their older years, we've got people that are suffering from isolation, from a sense of not good enough, from depression, from a range of mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. And what peer support is, is saying there are people that have been through what you've been through and understand where you are. Mm -hmm. you, they are a very important person to talk to, mm -hmm. who will understand, who will empathise. So uh, that's such an obvious thing to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it probably existed, you know, back when communities never shifted. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, communities, people didn't move out. Um, they looked out for each other. And we, we had mechanisms, you know. So people weren't lonely because it was small communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so experience, lived experience, is a currency that we need to value, you know, like we've never valued before. Mm -hmm. Where else are you going to get that kind of insight? Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. yes. Um, experience. <laughs> Last question's a big one. If you could change anything in the world, what would it be and why? I would change the kind of politics that we have. Because I don't, I, I think Western democracies have got kind of beyond democracy. You know, we've got this kind of, it's almost like a post-democratic uh, stage where you vote. And so we've got representative politics. Mm. And I want to see participative politics. So your vote is just one part of a mechanism of involvement. And I want to see far more participation in, in the running of the country. But mm. it starts in local neighbourhoods in local cities and we need leadership to do that we need strong you know visionary leadership and leadership is about you know inspiring people to get engaged mm. it's not about telling people what you what they should do yeah it's inspiring them it's making them believe that they have got something 
of immense value to contribute. Mm -hmm. And that's what democracy should be about, and it's not. Yeah, sadly it isn't, you're right. Mm. Yeah. Well, I've had a great, great time speaking with you, Mike. Um, it's been so much fun. I, I, I love your, your enthusiasm and your passion for life. Uh, it just, you know, it comes across so much. And, and if people look at this and say, what a pain in the backside. <laughs> I'm not always, you know, I will always find that enthusiasm for life, even if, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit down. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I don't go around the world, you know, smiling and laughing and bouncing up and down, but I've got it there and it's always there to call on. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. So don't say I'm a pain in the arse, <laughs> because I'm not like this all the time. You know what I'm saying? Mike, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's been brilliant. So, I've yeah. thoroughly enjoyed myself as well. Thank Good. you very I'm much. I'm glad. You're absolutely welcome. Great questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mike, thank you. Cheers. <laughs>